Welcome to the management space of the SWPS University and to China Talk, a series of interviews with leading global experts on China and East Asia. The series, uh, we already have almost a year of the series being, being at the management space, is produced jointly by the Polish Chinese Business Council and the SWPS University. And all interviews are hosted also jointly by representatives of these two institutions. So here with me, I have Mr. Zbigniew Nishobenski, the president hello. of the Polish Chinese Business Council. Zbigniew, hello. Hello. And myself, I'm Marcin Jacobi. I'm head of the Department of Asian Studies here at SWPS University. Please remember that this is a live webinar, so you can ask questions using the chat function. And also, please have a look at uh, our dedicated YouTube channel, where we have a lot of previous webinars on China and East Asia. And of course, you can find us in podcasts and Spotify and iTunes. Today we'll be talking about the automotive industry in China and we have a, a guest who will probably tell us uh, or knows the most about this uh, this topic, Mr. Dominique de Klerk, who is a chief representative of ACEA, the European Automotive Manufacturers Association in China. Uh, a very interesting bio, he is a Belgian national, but he has been working in China for almost 40 years, almost continuously. He's my fellow sinologist who graduated from Leiden University in the Netherlands, and he has worked in several industries, several sectors in China, including the pharmaceutical sector, including the telecommunications, the electric, and now, of course, the automotive. Um, he will be telling us um, uh, a lot about the present situation, about the outlook, and um, we'll... Uh, uh, I hope learn a lot from the presentation that he will present first, and then we will start discussing these issues. Uh, Mr. Dominique de Clerc, welcome very, very much to the series. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Yakobi, for your introduction. And the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, let me uh, start by saying a few words about the uh, organization that I uh, represent. ASEA, as uh, mentioned, it is the European uh, Automobile Manufacturers Association. It's based in Brussels and it has uh, as members 15 uh, OEMs, uh, which are BMW, uh, Iveco, uh, DAF, the Dutch uh, truck maker, Daimler, Ferrari, Ford, Honda, Hyundai, Jaguar Land Rover, Renault, the new company Stellantis, which is, as you know, the uh, fusion of uh, uh, Peugeot, Citroën and Fiat Chrysler, uh, Toyota, Volkswagen, Volvo Cars and Volvo Trucks. And uh, these groups, these uh, 15 companies, represent many more brands, as I think you know. Uh, for instance, uh, if we talk about uh, Stellantis, as I just mentioned, we have uh, 14 automotive brands under this one name, uh, Alfa Romeo, Chrysler, Citroën, Dodge, DS Automobile, Fiat, Jeep, Lancia, Maserati, uh, Opel, Peugeot, and the same is true for others. Just to mention Volkswagen, you all know how many brands are under that one umbrella. Now, uh, ASEA's uh, only overseas office next to the headquarters in Brussels is the one in Beijing. Uh, which was established in 2004. And all of uh, ASEA's member companies either have production plants in China or they export to China. Uh, one more member we have in China that we do not have in Europe, that is General Motors of the US, which uh, divested itself of its European subsidiaries and ceased being a member in Europe, but is still a member of the association in China. Now, um, in the run-up to this uh, webinar, um, Zbigniew indicated to me a number of issues that are of practical concern to you, and I will uh, try to address a number of those. But I think it is important that we um, address present concerns against a background of understanding of where China and its automotive industry come from. Uh, so that's where I want to start. And in any case, I think, given the present uh, you know, situation, uh, it is more and more imperative for all of us to understand China a bit better, because the country becomes more and more important geopolitically and econ economically. And I think that is one of the reasons why your business council uh, exists in the first place. 
So to, 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 to go back quite a while, but I will keep it short. Uh, prior to uh, the open door policy in, that started in 1979, China already produced plenty of trucks to move goods around, but hardly any cars. Uh, both trucks and cars were, were copies of uh, Soviet models, and uh, they didn't change for decades. And in these uh, Maoist times, uh, the notion of a car market was completely inconceivable. Uh, indeed, the notion of private ownership did not exist. One has to realize that the right to private property was written into the Constitution of the People's Republic of China only in 2004. Before 2004, private property was not allowed. Can you imagine that? So we have come a long way. Um, with, with, with China's opening up, uh, foreign investment, of course, started flowing into the country. Uh, obviously, the reason why China has welcomed foreign investment is to serve its own national interest. Uh, not for nothing, the government agency that decides which sectors of the economy need foreign investment uh, in China, this agency is called why it's, it's, uh, it's called in full the Directorate General for the Utilization of Foreign Investment. Now in China, under the uh, uh, you know jurisdiction of the National Development and Re Reform Commission. So from the start, foreign investment was meant to help develop China's economy, and that is why initially for every foreign investment project. The investment model had to be, and often still is, a Sino-Foreign Joint Venture Company. In such a structure, the foreign investor could hold a stake of 50% at the maximum, and the Chinese partner, usually a state-owned company, was meant to receive technological know-how from the foreign side, and to learn and to assimilate this know-how, eventually, in order to be able to stand on its own feet. So the first automotive ventures were American Motors Corporation with a Jeep assembly line in Beijing in 1984, Shanghai Volkswagen from 1984, and the Guangzhou Peugeot Automobile Company that was established in 1985 and gave up in despair in 1997. Uh, General Motors and others followed in the 90s. Volkswagen grew to become the largest car producer in China. In 1995, Volkswagen had at least 70% of the Chinese car market. And even today, with 14%, it remains the largest player. But throughout the 1990s, the overall market was very small. China's annual automobile production capacity first exceeded 1 million in 1992. And that number had only doubled eight years later, in 2000. As mentioned earlier, a car market for private customers took time to develop, and most cars at that time were sold as taxis and as company cars. However, since prior to the 80s, there had never existed any domestic car production in China to speak of, even with this, with this small and still very much closed market, foreign brands took hold of the market from the beginning. By contrast, manufacturers had a de facto monopoly in the market for cars. No foreign brand made and still has made uh, any serious inroads in this. After 79, when China's open door policy was launched, the country experienced double digit GDP growth in five of the ensuing 10 years, although from a very low base. The economy certainly grew, but reforms advocated by uh, the then leader, Deng Xiaoping, were only half heartedly carried out, and in many cases actively resisted. It was a time of ferment and debate, of contest between the old and the new guard in the Chinese Communist Party, that came to a head as you will no doubt remember, in 1989, with the Tiananmen protests that ended in massacre. Uh, idealistic hopes for political reform by students and intellectuals were rendered more threatening to the party by something we often forget, that there was a disaffected urban working class that suffered under a 19% inflation rate in that year. The upshot of the crisis, however, was that the leadership decided to double its reform efforts and accelerate raising the people's living standards. Um, Deng Xiaoping's southern tour gave impetus to the opening reform drive in 1992, and then under the vice premiership and later premiership of Zhu Rongji, thousands of loss-making state enterprises were wound up, and millions of workers lost their iron rice bowl, as it was called at the time, that is to say, a state-guaranteed job for life. 
Private home and car ownership began to be promoted. The early 1990s also saw the start of the country's massive plan to upgrade its network of roads, leading up to the current situation, where China can boast the world's longest and most modern network of express highways. In short, the 90s saw a real determination among China's leadership to liberalize the economy, to allow for the emergence of a middle class, and also to create the conditions for a car market to develop. This period culminated in 2001 with China's accession to the WTO. With the um, drastic reduction in import tariffs that came with WTO membership, more automotive companies, OEMs as well as suppliers, rushed into the country. By 2002, Toyota, Nissan, Mazda, Honda, Hyundai and Kia had established joint ventures. BMW came in 2004. Daimler set up Beijing Benz in 2005. All ASEA members set up China subsidiaries, either to manage import business or to launch local production. Their local joint venture partners were and still, still are today the state-owned Big Four corporations. SAIC, that is Shanghai Automotive Industry Corporation, Tungfeng in Wuhan, FAW, that is for First Auto Works, and Chang'an, as well as all the Chinese car manufacturers that are partly or wholly owned by provincial governments. Uh, Geely, Beijing Automotive Group, Brilliance Automotive, Guangzhou Automobile Group, Great Wall, BYD, Cherry, and Zhanghuai. It is a curious fact that some of these have partnered up with two or even more mutually competing foreign OEMs. Thus, Saik in Shanghai has joined ventures with both Volkswagen and General Motors. Dongfeng in Wuhan has joined ventures with both Nissan, Renault and PSA, PSA, and so on. This brings me to the question of the geographical distribution of the automotive industry in China. Essentially, multinationals start out geographically where their local joint venture partner is located and suppliers set up business close to these localities. Thus, the uh, Yangtze Delta, comprising Shanghai, serves Saic, Volkswagen and GM as a production and supply base. And the same can be said about the Pearl River Delta when it comes to Guangzhou Automobile Group, or about Changchun and Shenyang in the Northeast when it comes to First Auto Works and Brilliant Automotive, about Wuhan and its environs when it comes to Tongfeng with its partners Peugeot and Citroën, as well as Renault. But I think beyond this, it's very difficult to be clear about how it is geographically uh, distributed, because every Chinese province tries to attract investment in automotive. And in spite of calls for uh, restructuring and rationalization over the years, the industry remains quite fragmented and productivity gains must certainly be achievable if assets and resources should be concentrated more rationally. Regional protectionism is fierce, however, with uh, provinces and municipalities competing over investments and employment. And this has been the case for as long as I've been in China, and it seems that the central government is in, incapable of really changing uh, this, this uh, rivalry and this protectionism of province after province after province. As a consequence, production plans are not optimized and overcapacity is definitely an issue. But to come back uh, to my story, between 2002 and 2007, the Chinese automobile market began to grow exponentially. In this period, it grew by an average 21% or 1 million vehicles year on year. In 2009, China produced 13.8 million automobiles, of which 8 million were passenger cars and 3.4 million were commercial vehicles. And for the first time in that year, surpassed the United States as the world's largest automobile producer by volume. In 2010, both sales and production topped 18 million units, with 13.8 million passenger cars sold. This was the largest figure by any nation in history. GDP growth was around 10% per year between 2000 and 2010. One has to wait for the next decade, 2010-2020, to see a more direct correlation between single-digit GDP growth of 8-6% to annually and equally uh, single-digit automotive market growth. When the market for cars uh, really took off 
from 2000 onwards, there emerged at the same time the need for a regulatory framework for automotive products, the need to legislate for the safety of cars and trucks, for their environmental impact and for their responsible use. In Europe, because we have to start comparing these two now, the, the first vehicle exhaust emission standard, Euro 1, was introduced in 1992. Euro 2 followed four years later and today in 2021, Cars and trucks in Europe need to fulfill Euro 6 standards since 2014. China introduced a similar China 1 emission standard in 2000. And over the course of this year, 2021, newly sold cars and trucks in China will need to comply with the China 6 emission standard to be allowed onto the road. That is to say that in merely 20 years, China caught up with the European Union's 30 years of emission controls legislation and in fact even overtook the EU, as the China 6 emission standard is actually more stringent than the corresponding Euro 6 standard. Uh, as an unfortunate consequence for all of us, uh, the European Union now believes they need a Euro 7 emission standard. And I'm sure that China will follow. So this is a, a kind of a, a, a game without end. Anyway. In terms of safety, <clears throat> the China National Technical Committee for Automotive Standardization, that's what the organization is called, um, embarked on the huge task of transposing Europe's UN ECE standards into Chinese technical standards, with which vehicles need to comply in order to be type approved by the Ministry of Industry, and in order to be issued with license plates by the Ministry of Public Security. So that was a huge continuing uh, regulatory effort and a road traffic safety law, the first one that China knew, was passed in 2003. So the, the conditions slowly were put into place to make the Chinese automotive market comparable to what we know and it was a really a, a game changing situation. And as you can imagine, European car and truck makers have been quite fortunate that uh, China adopted European technical regulations as the major reference from the very start. This has meant that uh, ASEA has been able to play a constructive role in serving as a communication bridgehead between regulators and test labs in the EU and China, thus improving mutual understanding. Another such important commonality between the EU and China is that the measurement of both exhaust emissions and fuel consumption and emissions is determined by the new European driving cycle or NETC, which is, as you probably know, a stylized cycle assuming a certain typical representative driving behavior against which a vehicle's fuel consumption and emissions level are measured. Uh, so to have the same measuring method in China and Europe has helped uh, us, all our OEMs, uh, pretty much. Um, however, China's way of uh, regulating uh, fuel consumption limits, to take that as an example, for light duty passenger vehicles, uh, copies the EU with an important twist. The initial objective has not been, as in the EU, to gradually reduce CO2 emissions in the broader context of tackling global warming, although we will come to that issue. But the objective has been from the beginning to reduce China's oil imports. The initial aim was thus more centered on national security, reducing a dangerous dependency on fuel from the Middle East, than on bettering the environment. This same concern mostly explains why China started paying serious attention to the development of electric vehicles. In 2001, uh, coordinated by the Ministry of Science and Technology, the so-called Project 863 was launched, bringing an association of state-owned companies together to work on R&D for new energy vehicles and on their standardization. Over the years, the government poured untold billions into NEV development, subsidized the creation of dozens, if not hundreds, of electric vehicle startups, and is today a world leader in electric buses used in public transport, also in many Western cities although I understand that Warsaw at least has Polish-made electric buses. Um, NEV development has also been touted as a Chinese strategy to leapfrog, as it was called, 
the auto industry's mainstream uh, technology, that is to say the internal combustion engine technology. And therefore, or thereby, to, 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 to get over, to dent, to, to break the technological advantage traditionally enjoyed by foreign OEM. China introduced a um, fuel economy standard for passenger cars in 2005. Um, it established 16 curb mass classes and set the maximum fuel consumption limit for each, each such vehicle weight class. It did so in two phases. Phase one took effect in 2005 and phase two, which tightened the fuel consumption limits per weight class by approximately 10 percent, began in 2008. Uh, both these standards were per model standards. That is to say, they required each vehicle model to comply with these fuel consumption limits before being allowed to enter the market. Unfortunately, while in 2009, the national average fuel consumption for the whole fleet stood at 7.78 liter per 100 kilometers, which is equivalent, equivalent in our European terms to 180.5 grams of CO2 per kilometer, a year later, this average started to rise instead of go down. The reason for this bad news was the same as in Europe and elsewhere. That is to say, the sudden popularity of SUVs. Heavier, larger engine displacement and high fuel consuming cars on the Chinese market, just as on the European market. Until this time, the Chinese fuel economy standards had stipulated that per weight class, uh, newly approved passenger cars could consume a maximum amount of so much liter per 100 kilometer, or otherwise, type of fuel would not be given. SUVs did not consume more fuel than allowed, but it was just that there were more SUVs sold. So the government had not foreseen how popular SUVs would prove to be. Consumer behavior in the real world, in other words, was at odds with government scenarios. And this prompted an important shift in the regulatory approach opted for in the next phase, the phase three fuel, fuel economy standards. This third phase took effect in 2012. It did not do away with fuel limits per weight class, but introduced the, for China, entirely new notion that government and industry shared a joint responsibility for shaping the auto market. For the first time, the concept of corporate average fuel consumption, CAFC, was brought in from the US and the EU. The national target by 2015 was to achieve average fuel consumption of 7 liter per 100 kilometer for the whole new vehicle fleet sold in that year, which translates to an average 167 grams CO2 per kilometer in our European way of expressing this. And this was to be brought about by every manufacturer as well as importer being held accountable for meeting its own CAFC targets. So, the, the, for, for imported cars in particular, uh, there was no longer an obligation per vehicle model to stick to a certain fuel consumption limit, but the whole thing of what you sold as a company, as an importer, importer needed to have this average target of fuel consumption met. Although by European standards, 167 grams CO2 was not very challenging, still the fuel consumption limits per weight class were progressively tightened. And as we come forward in time, uh, in the context of the fight against climate change, uh, these limits and these restrictions were still not going far enough. China, as you know, is a signatory to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, to the Doha Amendment of 2012, and later the Paris Agreement of 2015. And in 2012, China's State Council released the uh, energy saving and new energy vehicle industrialization plan for the period 2012-2020, which states that um, uh, that by 2020, uh, in order to reach these global warming uh, targets, the average fleet target in terms of gasoline consumption should reach 5 liter per 100 kilometer in that year 2020. At the phase 4 fuel consumption standard, we mentioned one, two, and three, now we are at four, uh, set this target into stone when it was promulgated in 2014 to take effect in 2016. So uh, now the scope of the standard was broadened to include not just ICE vehicles, but also plug-in electric vehicles and gas-powered vehicles. 
battery, battery electric vehicles also. And indeed, uh, just as in Europe, to achieve ever more stringent uh, fuel consumption targets and to achieve, in this case, the 5 liter per 100 kilometer target with just in internal combustion engine vehicles alone, it becomes quite, quite difficult, especially with the SUV segment still growing continuously, unless you put into the mix a sizable number of zero fuel consuming electrical vehicles. And in China, new energy vehicles, NEVs, are defined as battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and fuel cell electric vehicles in order to make that mix and in order to reach that uh, quite demanding uh, five liter target. Um, I have not mentioned, uh, maybe it's a te technical, but anyway, that these successive fuel consumption standards have phased in schedules year by year until full compliance is achieved in the target year. This is the case also for the next phase, phase five, which entered into force in 2017 and goes down with the fuel consumption target to four liters per 100 kilometer for the year 2025, so in the near future, which is a 20% reduction as compared to five liters in 2020 last year. Now, in the uh, uh, corresponding regulatory text, uh, which is called the, the, the Administration Rules for Corporate Average Fuel Consumption and New Energy Vehicle Credits, also known as the Dual Credit Rules of 2017, um, annual targets are set for the number of NEVs or credit points corresponding to NEVs that need to be sold in the portfolio of any local manufacturer or importer in fulfillment of a company's combined fuel consumption and electrical vehicle target. So uh, this is a, a bit compact the way I put it, but more specifically, uh, the Chinese state has commanded every importer and local manufacturer selling more than 30,000 cars to have part of these consisting of electrical vehicles. For 2019, it has to be 10% of what you sell. In 2020, 12%. And the latest edition of these dual credit rules continues these mandatory sales quota for electrical vehicles for 2022 to 2023 as 14% in 2021, so this year, 16% next year, and 18% in 2023, respectively. So, to take this year as an example, 2021, Every car company needs to fulfill two targets. One is its corporate average fuel consumption target, which is the amount of liters of gasoline consume, consumed per 100 kilometer by the traditional cars that it sells this year. This amount is defined per weight class of the different car models that are sold. Um, and, the, and the weighted average yields the company's target value, let's just say six, six liters per 100 kilometer. If the actual car models sold are more fuel efficient then the standard stipulates, the company earns positive credit points. If the company sells gas guzzling models, which in practice is especially the case for imported premium or race car models, then it may well have earned itself negative credit points. Simultaneously, every, every company must sell in this year a total of new energy vehicles, in practice battery electric cars, amounting to 14% of its entire model portfolio sold during the year. If the company reaches this or exceeds this target, it earns positive credit points. If it fails to reach this target, it finds itself in a position of negative credit. In the next step, in the course of the next year 2022, when the books for 2021 will have been closed, companies and the government too know whether they are in the black or in the red in terms of credit points earned. And then they have to engage in trading with other companies, either to set off negative credit by buying credit points, or to sell excess positive credit points to others. This system is different from Europe and quite original, in fact, in that the government, in theory, does not intervene. That is to say, whereas in Europe, a company that exceeds its CO2 target is penalized by the government and has to pay a, pay a fine that may this year be as high as 2,500 euros per car sold for some companies, China has no such penalties and relies on a trading system between companies. The question then becomes, how is the value of credit points defined? Theoretically, what a defaulting company should pay should not be so high as to bankrupt that company. 
but still higher than what it would cost a company to get its act together. That is to say, to develop more fuel efficient vehicle models and of course electrical models. But will an open market in credit points, which China has, achieve such pricing? And it appears that it does. In 2019 and 2020, the two first years that such NEV sales quota applied, there were, uh, thanks to China's two decades of financial support for electrical vehicle startups, uh, over 100 pure NEV producers who sold not 10% or 12% of NEVs, like they had to in 2019-2020, but per definition 100%, because they are NEV-making companies, that could have created an excess of positive credit on the market, devaluing the price of credit points, but because traditional OEMs did not have enough NEVs ready in the product, product pipeline, and also were not eligible for Chinese government subsidies for NEV purchasers, they couldn't achieve even 10% or 12% NEV sales. And therefore, a balance between supply and demand was naturally created. In 2018-2019, as the experiment, experiment took off, credit points went for an average price of a few hundred yuan RMB, a few dozen euros in other words. The, the specific price in every case depended on negotiation between buyer and seller, and only the two companies making the transaction knew the real price. By 2019, the price had gone up to over 2,000 yuan on average. So in this free market, the government does not have to intervene otherwise, but by tightening the dual credit rules, by reducing the number of credit points one earns with an NEV model, and by increasing the NEV annual sales quota, 16, 18% as we have mentioned. But it needs not to set the price of credit itself. I would like at this point to add a footnote um, to what new energy vehicle means. Both uh, battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and hydrogen powered fuel cell vehicles are included in the definition of the term. But in practice, NEVs are limited to battery electric vehicles only. China has not mastered uh, plug-in hybrid technology developed initially by Toyota and largely for that reason does not extend subsidies to buyers of non-Chinese plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So that these vehicles have no market advantage over ICE vehicles. As for hydrogen, although in recent years some 15 different technical standards have been published on fuel cell electric vehicles, the greatest stumbling block towards their development is that over 60% of the 2,000 tons of hydrogen produced in China today is made from coal. If China is serious about its commitment to achieve peak emissions by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060, as announced last year by President Xi Jinping, hydrogen as produced by the present pathway cannot have a great future. Nevertheless, in the one government blueprint that envisages a future scenario for hydrogen vehicles, it is mentioned that perhaps one million hydrogen trucks and buses could be on China's roads by 2035. This is not a binding document, it's just a scenario, and it lacks any detail how to get there. Uh, among ASEAN member companies, Scania and Volvo Trucks are quite positive on the future of hydrogen for trucks. As regards passenger cars, Toyota and Hyundai uh, pursue fuel cell vehicle development. But others, such as BMW, who did in the past do, do the same thing, uh, seem to have abandoned the subject. By now, we have arrived in the present, and it becomes now very difficult to speak about any subject with the insurance, assurance one has when talking about the past. I will address three topics very briefly. Electrification or decarbonization, connected and automated driving, and EU-China relations. Just as in Europe, the supply of electric vehicles to the market is driven by government action. In Europe, by ever more stringent CO2 limits. In China, by mandatory NEV sales quota while the demand for electric vehicles is driven by government incentives. In China, these incentives are essentially twofold. Subsidies are given out to more or less reduce the price of electric vehicle by half. And in major cities, a cap is set on the number of license plates issued each year for new ICE vehicles, encouraging consumers to choose an electric vehicle for which no such cap applies. These evident distortions of the normal interplay of supply and demand make it very difficult to gauge what the real consumer appetite for electric vehicles is. Certainly, a first Chinese government target for electric vehicles, that there should be 2 million of them produced and sold per year by the year 2020, last year, has been proved optimistic, wrong. 
to give the fig to give the figures on uh, 24 million passenger cars sold in 2018 1 million were nevs on 20 million units sold in 2019 again 1 million were nevs and on 20 million sold in 2020 1.2 million were nevs uh, there, was, there were there are corresponding figures for commercial vehicles uh, which are the tens and hundreds of thousands um, when you look at what these vehicles are for commercial vehicles the electric ones are buses distribution vans mail delivery vans garbage collecting trucks so all for inner city use and therefore not comprising heavy duty trucks at all uh, substantially uh, sorry similarly a big percentage of passenger car electrical vehicles are taxi fleets not so much private consumption so putting these figures together and the characteristic of the things that are being sold, what, what, what these cars and these trucks are used for, uh, last year, total NEV sales amounted to 1.3 million units, that is to say 700,000 short of the government objective, 2 million. That, de that demonstrates that the demand is simply not yet there. Um, as a consequence of the fact that the demand is not yet there, uh, market distortions continue. I have mentioned that mandatory NEV sales quota increased this year to 40% and 60% and 80% in the years to come, so as to reach one-fifth of the total, total vehicle market by 2025. Uh, corresponding to this interventionism on the supply side, likewise on the demand side, the Chinese government has decided to prop this up by continuing to spend, to spend money on subsidies. Europe is in fact no better in this regard. Germany increased its subsidies for electrically charged vehicles last year. In this context, when one reads that the number of EVs registered in Europe last year was 143% higher than in 2019, uh, you don't know what such a figure means. It has no, 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 no genuine significance as to the market uptake of electric vehicles. Um, However, like the CEOs of most of our OEM member companies and like the governments all over the developed world, including, of course, China, uh, I also believe that the shift to electric vehicles is irreversible. As uh, charging infrastructure is being deployed on a large scale and as the cost of batteries decreases, and uh, as perhaps alternatives for rare earth metals can be found, an electric vehicle, an electric vehicle will pro probably become an ever more financially viable proposition. The range of these vehicles is already comparable to ICEs, and uh, for long-haul trucks and coaches, maybe fuel cell powertrains may become an increasingly viable solution. What seems, unless I am mistaken, wholly unsolved, is how to supply this NEV vehicle part of the not-too-distant future with green and renewable electricity. Only a few small nations, favored with exceptional natural condition, conditions, such as Norway and its hydropower, or Iceland, with hydropower and geothermal power, seem realistically capable of doing so. But as far as mitigating climate change is concerned, at least the automotive industry and its regulatory authorities worldwide are in the process of doing their bit. Uh, it must be added that such, such huge investments have been made in, ele in electrification that by now nobody can afford that it should fail. Secondly, connected and automated vehicles. The two terms are used in conjunction, but they are not the same thing. Uh, connected vehicles can exchange information wirelessly with other vehicles infrastructure, but also with the vehicle manufacturer or third party service providers. That brings with it the promise of early warnings being delivered to the car driver about traffic congestion, congestion or accidents, or of timely communication between the vehicle OBD system and the OEM about maintenance and repair of the vehicle or involving software up updates. It also includes the possibility of uh, streams of infotainment being beamed to the car occupants, well beyond GPS positioning and driving directions. Automated vehicles, on the other hand, are vehicles in which at least some aspects of safety critical control functions occur without direct driver input, that is to say, they occur automatically. Here one distinguishes the levels of automation, L1 to L5, I suppose is uh, known to you, uh, ending up at fully automated, automated driving at what is called L5. Um, among the advantages of automotive driving are, su are supposed, to, supposed to be uh, greater or even absolute traffic safety, although for the moment what you hear more about is uh, accidents that, uh, that uh, result in deaths with Tesla recently, uh, as well as, ideally, a greater freedom of mobility for the elderly. 
In China, the customary term for connected and automated vehicles is intelligent and connected vehicles, but that is a merely a matter of words. So, uh, both in China and here, um, intelligent and connected vehicles are uh, really at the forefront of uh, R&D and standardization works. But for all these functionalities to, to work, uh, massive amounts of data need to be generated by cameras, sensors and radar mounted in the car and processed by its onboard computers. And similarly, the car is or will soon be bombarded by streams of data coming from all kinds of third parties. In Europe, debate, debate is going on on how to categorize all these data and how to define to whom different data belong and who can have access to them, under what legal and commercial conditions. In China, the same debate gets underway as well, with the Chinese characteristic that the state is bound to claim a fairly absolute right of access to all data. Uh, this can be safely deduced from China's cybersecurity law of 2016. The law stipulates, among other things, that data generated in China have to stay on servers in China. Detailed rules spelling out what this means for the automotive industry are still being awaited. However, since big data inevitably invite attention of the government for reasons of national security, the risk is very real going forward that intelligent and connected vehicle development in China will require conformity with uniquely Chinese rules and regulations, and therefore that multinational OEMs will increasingly have to conduct R&D for such vehicles in China itself, specifically, specifically for the Chinese market. Um, so standardization work on all kinds of automotive driver assistance systems, driver assistance systems, ADAS, uh, is in full swing in China. But with Europe lacking the equivalence of the Chinese Huawei, Alibaba and Tencent, who in China drive the development very much as much as do the authorities, we in Europe are at some risk of being left behind in this race. This brings me, and I come to the end, to the relation of China to the Western world. Uh, politically, relations are, of course, tense at the moment, and the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, seven years in the making, will definitely not be ratified anytime soon by the European Parliament and by the EU member states. That is a pity, as it undoubtedly marks an important step forward in China's commitment to allow greater market access for European firms. It can only be hoped that politicians on both sides find ways to agree to disagree while continuing to value the close economic links that bind us to China. After all, from 2000 to 2020, cumulative investment from the EU into China reached 148 billion euros, while in the same period, Chinese direct investment into Europe totaled 117 billion euros. In this regard, the joint China-US statement on global warming issued only a few weeks ago in Shanghai by John Kerry and his Chinese counterpart, Xie Guohua, demonstrates that even when the going gets rough, the two superpowers are still able to compartmentalize the issues, separating the contentious ones from others where cooperation remains desirable. And in the automotive area, we see cooperation between China and the West continuing unabated. This is, for instance, the case in standardization, where China has taken up an increasingly active role in Geneva, where the UN 1990 uh, eight agreements that produces global technical regulations uh, gives rise to lots of working groups of which China today uh, is the uh, chair of two, I think, on electrical vehicle safety. And also uh, China took up the president's chair at the International Association of Automotive Associations, OICA, in Paris, which is important because OICA in its turn is active in uh, standardization uh, activities again in uh, in UNECE context. So, so uh, I believe that, that, that shows that we are st still cooperating and that this con continue, that this is, you know, will, will hopefully continue to be the case. And, 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 uh, and uh, as China's role in this is less and less that of a follower of other countries' norms and standards, and more and more that of an initiator, a standard setter, that gives China in turn an international responsibility that I'm sure uh, bodes well for the future. Um, finally, is there still a future for the European auto industry in China? I, I firmly believe that there is. Uh, China needed our technology in the past. With electrical and intelligent and connected vehicles, it will gradually free itself from dependence on foreign know-how. 
Um, especially where chips, electronic control units, ECUs are concerned, uh, there are strong reasons for China to try to achieve self-sufficiency and technological independence from the West. But that does not make European OEMs and parts suppliers irrelevant. Uh, management skills and the difficult art of brand development are more intangible areas of expertise, where Chinese competitors are still behind our long-established corporations. And perhaps most important, the Chinese people have developed a taste for freedom when it comes to choosing consumer goods, such as cars. And now that European auto brands have, after decades of investment, taken firm roots on Chinese soil, there will no doubt always be Chinese customers attracted to European brands. And after all, the Chinese car market is still young and full of growth potential. By staying nimble and adapted to it, I, can, I think that we can, for decades to come, remain active players in this unfolding story. Thank so, you very much, Dominique. My it, it was absolutely great and you answered <laughs> most of the questions that we prepared industri industriously to ask you after well, your introduction. It was a very, very thorough. Uh, I'm sure Zbigniew uh, will want to ask you some questions nevertheless. I just want to point out that it's really fascinating how late the regulations in China came and how fast they changed and also how China is modeling the industry behavior very similarly to how it's modeling social behavior as well. Uh, with the credit, social credit system, etc. So I, I'm very interested in these things. But speaking of over to you, because we don't really have a lot of time left. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for this background. Uh, so maybe the first my question is uh, related uh, with the latest changes on the negative list. So Western companies uh, have the opportunity now to operate in China as wholly owned foreign enterprises. In the European world, well, Volkswagen, Mercedes, Honda, Ford uh, say to goodbye to their Chinese partners. So will the status quo be mentioned in mid-term and long-term perspective? What do you think about it? Uh, I, I didn't mention it, but it's, of course, a very important uh, liberalizing measure that uh, the joint venture restrictions are going away. They've uh, been taken away in 2019 for electrical vehicles, in 2020 for trucks and buses, and in 2022, for that, I'm sure, 2022, next year, uh, they will go away for passenger cars as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so in, indeed, Volkswagen and all the others might, might uh, in theory, buy their Chinese partners out and, and go it alone. Um, for sure, in the last 30 years, if not more, Nobody has ever said that the joint venture model is uh, easy to manage. It's it's uh, it's definitely a headache. But on the other hand, um, I think I think uh, a joint venture partner, even if it's a minority one, uh, does give a, a, a foreign company a certain political legitimacy and, and and certain doors that open towards the government. So that has a certain value in any case. But besides this, um, trying to to buy a Chinese partner out today would be colossally expensive. And so I do not expect uh, very much to happen and certainly not quickly. There is one uh, striking example where things have moved and that is with BMW, uh, where they will now take 75% of their joint venture in the north in Shenyang, where they, of course they started like all the others with 50%. But this was not so much their own initiative as a uh, suggestion which uh, BMW could hardly refuse, from the Prime Minister of China himself, uh, who, who, who wanted, I suppose, to prove that liberalization is something that the Chinese government takes really seriously. So this this will now now happen. I, of course, have no idea how much it will cost to BMW. To BMW. It's not, not, not something I'm, I'm privy to, this information. But I think, I, think, I think we will see only very incremental steps towards changing uh, capitalist um, uh, ratios in the joint ventures. No big surprises and not quickly. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned uh, the role of new technologies um, uh, in uh, um, this sector. So uh, in China, we hear not only about the, the participation on these companies such as Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, Huawei, uh, and the supply chains uh, of car manufacturers, but uh, they are also becoming investors uh, in the industry by taking uh, over shares in existing uh, companies or creating new models, new brands. 
how do you see this process of displacing traditional automotive companies from the market by the, 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 the tech companies? It's possible to replace to I, I think it's a challenge that we should take very seriously. Uh, of course, we are proud of our long-standing you know, um, companies that not just make cars, but also know about uh, distribution and sales and uh, after-sales services and all these things that are difficult to learn, take a lot of investment and which all these startups, let alone a Huawei or a Tencent, have never heard of. But uh, First of all, we are going more and more to cars and, and mobility models in which uh, IT companies have an increasingly large role to play and where we are not ourselves so strong. Uh, secondly, they have deep pockets. There are you know, lots, of, lots of money to invest. Uh, thirdly, if you look at all these startups in the electrical field, without even talking about the, 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 the uh, investments of Huawei or Tencent or others, uh, the Chinese uh, public that buys cars is very young and very open towards uh, innovation and novelty, quite quite willing to, to try it out, to buy. Uh, so so, so uh, from, from that point of view, people are, because they are young on average, not necessarily bound to traditional, traditional brands. Uh, so, so, so from, from that, that uh, point of view also, uh, one might see changes occurring in the market faster than we might see them in Europe. So I, I would, I, I would, uh, as I said myself, and, and to, to my regret, I think it's a pity that we lack in Europe uh, people like or companies like Huawei, Tencent, Alibaba, that that might also here speed up development. Right. Um, we have uh, two questions from the audience, and you actually answered at least part of them. But I still want to 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 ask these, and maybe you can just add a little bit more. First, you you talked about hydrogen. Um, fuel cell vehicles and uh, as I understand the limited supply of hydrogen in the foreseeable future which might limit the, the market for these cars. Is um, technology too expensive as well? Is it another factor that limits the sales of hydrogen cars? Uh, the technology of building infrastructure to charge, uh, to, to fill cars up with, uh, with uh, hydrogen is still very expensive, yes. Um, because it has to happen at uh, extremely low, te low temperatures. Um, I, I, I do not dare to look into the future because technology can change. And uh, fuel cell uh, technology does have a future if you look at trucks in the first place, long haul trucks. It's a better solution, it seems, than, uh, than batteries, which are too heavy. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned myself, maybe the biggest the biggest uh, obstacle is the fact that the hydrogen you make today, the more coal you have to use, and therefore it goes against the climate change objectives. Yeah, yeah, okay. And and uh, the second question from Ms. Sylvia Kanya was about the, the the political side, the U.S.-China trade war, and how it affects the NEVs. And and she asked, what are the sales forecasts? You, I remember you mentioned that most of the sales are in the public transport system and not so much in the private car sector. But maybe you can just uh, add some more information to that. Um, there, there, are, there are many things to be said. Uh, first of all, I think that more and more private people are also buying electrical cars. The question is only if they were free to choose uh, between a, 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 a traditional car and an electric car, and if there were no subsidies and no, no restrictions on license plates, would they really go for electrical cars? That's an open question. I think nobody really knows the answer. Um, but electrical cars and the cars of the future are more and more electronic products. Uh, therefore, uh, chips are more and more crucial. Therefore, the question becomes uh, to what extent US-China decoupling, as they say, might have an influence on the technological development of these things in China. But the answer that I suggested in my little speech was that China will, uh, you know, double, double charge its uh, efforts to uh, develop chips themselves. And sooner or later, I guess that will uh, succeed. So, so I, would, I wouldn't think that the US-China tension of the moment will really impact on the future of electrical vehicles in China. All right, thank you very much, Spignev. Uh, yes, uh, 
<clears throat> I had the question about uh, uh, the process of uh, building uh, the infrastructure, road infrastructure for electric vehicles. Yes, uh, has this process of building the charging station uh, in China on a massive scale uh, already started? Yes, it certainly has. Uh, there is uh, certainly more charging points in China uh, than in Europe. Mm -hmm. the, amb the, ambition is to have, the ambition is to have as many charging points as there are electrical vehicles. So, uh, because you need them in every house, in mm -hmm. principle. Uh, so so, uh, so, so the, the answer is yes. Uh, the problem in China today, but it's it's a problem that will be overcome, is that uh, electrical charging for vehicles is provided by different companies, different utility companies, and they have not really different standards, but they are not completely compatible. For instance, if the one will only accept this kind of credit card, and the other will only accept that kind of credit card, and that's a, that's a, that's a headache. So that has to be overcome. But in terms of deployment of charging points over the whole country, that is going quite well and faster than in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, due to the, the large number of cars uh, on China roads, the regist registration of the new cars uh, has always been uh, something that is uh, somehow limited. What is the process lo like today? You tell something about new electric vehicles by traditional cars. Um, the situation in China with traditional cars today is that most, not most, an increasing number of big cities wants to limit the number of cars in the cities. For instance, Beijing has um, about 6 million cars, normal cars, traditional cars, running around the roads, I believe, something mm -hmm. like that. And they want, to, they want to cap it at this, not to go over it. Therefore, they stop the number of license plates, new license plates being issued, or they submit this uh, issuance to a lottery system, as in Shanghai, or they're very expensive to buy, or you can't get them at all. But uh, in, at the same time, buying an electric car is made more easy. So they, they, they push the sales of electric cars and try to keep down the number of traditional cars. So license plates in more and more uh, cities in China, I think today it's 10, 15 or so of them, uh, are very hard to obtain. Mm -hmm. uh, which means also that the future car market for traditional cars must move gradually to third, fourth, fifth tier cities and to the countryside and outside of Beijing, Shanghai and so on, which are saturated. But but I have a I have a silly question here. I remember the huge traffic jams in in, in Beijing like I don't know, 15 years ago, and and it, it seems to be a little bit better now. If we only have a cap on traditional cars, but we don't have a cap on electric cars, I mean the traffic jams will come back. Absolutely. Yeah. So any you know how, how do authorities uh, look at this problem coming up? Well, uh, I think authorities in China and also Europe, by the way, but uh, in China even more perhaps. Uh, have this have this uh, this dream that technology will solve everything, and uh, therefore, if you have automated cars which are you know which are guided by an invisible hand to drive at the same speed without uh, or, you know you can, you can imagine what I mean. They, they think that traffic traffic uh, uh, congestion may may be solved through these technological means. Whether it will happen, I have no idea. I'm not particularly optimistic myself, uh, but it's certainly not solved. The, the congestion is still there. How about car sharing? Is this, uh, you know, the, the, the bicycle market has been, you know, doing great with all the sharing platforms and companies. How about cars? Is it uh, any solution for the future? Of course, it will be not that good for the industry because the sales will be lower. But uh, is it the future for Chinese cities? Uh, it depends what you, what you mean by car sharing. If you, if you mean things like, uh, like Uber, no, no, I mean the companies which, uh, for example, let's say the fully automated cars will arrive at your doorstep and you will, you know, use the car and then you, you will just park it somewhere and not care about it anymore. Yeah, but that, that, that's the future that everybody sees in his or her vision. Uh, to, when this will happen is, is uh, not very clear. The European Union has very ambitious targets for this. Eh? Uh, within a couple of years, they would like to see this happen in, in, in quite a number of cities. 
China has sim similar ambitions, but uh, f for now, I, 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 uh, I, I, I don't think we are there at all, given the safety uh, and responsibility issues that are not solved legally. So maybe now uh, I would uh, like to discuss about the topic which are uh, very, which is very important for Polish companies. Uh, so Poland is one of the most uh, important European uh, producer of spare parts. Our companies are, uh, are part of uh, the supply chains uh, of all European brands. In this context, uh, I would like to ask you about two uh, things. First of all, uh, do you think it's possible for Polish companies to enter the supply chains uh, of Chinese uh, car manufacturers uh, uh, such as uh, Geely or Great Wall? And secondly, how does the aftermarket function in China? And is there a chance to appear or the uh, is the uh, the uh, room to enter to this market for European Polish companies? If they are good enough, then I think I think the answer is yes. I mean the, the usual things you have to be in quality, price, and so on. But but uh, that, that that's that, that's of course not 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 a mystery. But I think the the general picture is that Polish and other companies can enter the market. Because, uh, like in Europe, although with some with some postponement, some delay, uh, China is also going towards a more and more open and free market for spare parts. Uh, for a long time, um, China wanted to have the system of um, uh, authorized vendors by the OEMs, in which the spare parts came from the OEMs, in order to in order to to, to set up a strong OEM-based auto market, but under the pressure of uh, suppliers from China and abroad. Uh, we have now come to a system where uh, repair and maintenance information, RMI, must be shared by authorized vendors with the rest of the market, and where therefore uh, third-party suppliers have an equal right to enter the market and the OEM uh, channels if they are competitive and so on enough. So we are getting to, 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 a, to a legal system where the market for spare parts becomes absolutely free depending then on how good you are in you know, doing your business. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, are reaching the end of our webinar. Mr. Dominique de Clerc, thank you very much for all the insight and, and really fascinating information that go much deeper than what we usually can read in the media and, and, and all the reports that are available widely. Um, Thank you very much for this, and I hope uh, all interested in the automotive industry will get a lot of insight from, okay. from, from your information there. My pleasure, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. And thank you, Zbigniew, and um, thank you to all our audiences. And please remember, you can find this and more webinars on our YouTube and Spotify and iTunes podcasts. Thank you very, very much, and see you next time. See you.